Hi and welcome to part 2 of the MCO CNC lathe retrofit series. In this video I will cover the machine cabinet, replacement of the stepper motors and tool modifications for the tool turret. As mentioned in the previous video, the machine cabinet for the MCO lathe was missing a bottom and a back panel. I'm assuming that these panels are not needed to provide rigidity for the lathe bed. Therefore I bought a couple of relatively thin aluminum sheets. You can order these to size, so the only thing that I had to do was drill some holes for mounting them to the machine. For sheet metal you can buy rivet nuts that can be installed with a special tool. First you have to drill a hole with a specific size to accommodate the rivet nut. Install the correct size mandrel into the tool and screw on a rivet nut. Then it's just a matter of placing it into the hole as far as it goes and you can close the tool. This will deform the rivet nut, clamping it onto the sheet metal. When this is done, you can remove the tool by screwing out the mandrel. Job done. I reinforced the bottom panel with some aluminum profiles and mounted a DIN rail onto it. I tried to fix the first profile in place with some pop rivets. I had used these before, but now for some reason they kept breaking off in the wrong place. After some unsuccessful troubleshooting, I ended up just drilling out the rivets and used nuts and bolts to fix the DIN rail and the other profiles. The bottom was finished up with rubber feet on each one of the corners. Here I'm mounting a DIN rail into the back of the lathe. Initially I was planning on just mounting components to this DIN rail and onto the bottom plate, but I changed that approach later on after I found that this was not the best way to use the available space, but more on that later. The lathe will live in a very tight space, so I decided to make a small table for it that stands on caster wheels. This will allow me to place it up against the wall, but I can still access the back later for maintenance by rolling the table forward. Anyway, just like I'm not a professional machine builder, I'm also not a cabinet maker. But I still managed to end up with a half decent table that is able to support the lathe. The machine weighs only at around 70 kilograms when completed, so I think this should work. As mentioned in the previous video, the existing stepper motors were removed since I'm not sure how to control them. They will be replaced with closed loop stepper motors with a similar torque rating of around 1 Nm. Both the X and Z axes are driven through MXL timing belts. I briefly considered going for GT2 belts and pulleys instead. The MXL belt standard uses a trapezoidal tooth profile, while the GT2 belt uses a more rounded tooth profile. The GT2 belts should have less backlash and are readily available, but I'm sticking with the MXL standard for this build, so I can reuse the custom pulley on the lead screw. Also, I'm not sure if I would even notice the difference between the two belt types for this application. I will put a link to a short article by Misumi on the differences between the two belt types in the description below. The existing belts seem to be in good condition. If they ever need to be replaced, that should be quite easy to do. MXL belts and pulleys are also quite readily available, for example on AliExpress, where you can also get custom sizes. I bought a set of 10 replacement belts from Pouch on AliExpress and paid around 24 US dollars for it. This is quite cheap in my opinion for a set of 10 custom belts. Although the old stepper motors look like they are NEMA 23, they are actually not, that would have been too simple. The whole pattern is slightly larger than for the standard NEMA 23 motor, so I have to either modify the existing mounting plate or make a new one. 
There is also a capacitive sensor on the existing mounting plate, for which I'm not sure how it's used, but I will not be reusing it in the new setup. For positioning, I should be covered by the closed loop steppers in combination with an initial homing cycle on limit switches. The ball screw seems to be rotating freely, but I will apply some grease on it before actually running the lathe, just to make sure that it's properly lubricated. Here I'm removing the tool turret and all kinds of brackets to gain access to the stepper motor for the x-axis, which is the same type as on the z-axis. Also this axis is moving freely and is driven by the same type of belt. To be able to do some testing with the new stepper motors mounted to the lathe, I first printed a couple of DIN rail mounts for the stepper drivers. This will be used until I find a better solution for mounting the drivers to a DIN rail. Also, I started prototyping a new stepper mounting plate that would fit the new NEMA 23 steppers. Using a 3D printed plate of the same thickness as a steel plate doesn't work. It obviously needs to be a lot thicker to have the same rigidity. Due to a different in shaft diameter, I was not able to easily transfer the pulley from the old stepper motors to the new ones. On AliExpress I found some MXL pulleys that would fit an 8mm shaft, but they were a bit taller than the old pulleys. This meant that I would have to use a thicker mounting plate. Luckily enough, the 3D printer plate had to be made thicker anyway for rigidity, so this was hitting two birds with one stone. It did require a bit of filing to make the pulleys fit onto the motor shaft. The new motor mounts were printed from PETG. This specific type of filament is called semi matte and it is indeed a lot less shiny than regular PTG. I think the matte finish looks a lot better on functional parts, but of course that's just my opinion. This is what happens when you accidentally print PETG with a PLA profile. The fans were at 100% during the sprint, with some heavy warping as a result. Also the whole pressing nuts into the side approach didn't work well for me, so I designed a new type and printed it with the correct settings this time. In Prusa Slicer I added 100% infill locally for additional strength. Here the nuts come in from the back. Make sure not to over tighten the screws here because you can easily go past the yield strength of the plastic with this type of solution. If these prototypes work and I have some time to spare later I might make new ones out of aluminum. But for now these plastic motor mounts work fine. One axis down, one more to go. The x-axis requires its own mounting plate, so I also designed one for this axis. Also this one took a couple of iterations before I had one that fit properly. I tried to modify existing parts as little as possible, but for the bracket that is holding the homing switch for the x-axis, I had to remove a small section to make it fit around the new motor mount. This process with the Dremel creates an enormous amount of grinding dust that gets everywhere, so this kind of job is best done outside.
Before I mounted the covers back onto the axis, I wanted to perform a dry run test, just to see if everything worked. Only the necessary components for this test were placed inside the cabinet and wired up. The 24 volt power supply and the stepper drivers. For this test, the CNC controller was placed below the lathe. Here the axes are manually jogged with the MPG. The sound is quite rough, as the stepper drivers are still set to a full step setting. I later applied micro-stepping, which dramatically improved the sound and smoothness of the motions. Now that the steppers were working, I placed the covers back on the cross slide and placed the tool turret back into its original position. In order to start out with the lathe, I bought a set of high-speed steel tools and a cheap set of tool holders with carbide inserts. These include boring bars, but for creating smaller diameter holes, I also got a couple of ER11 and ER16 tool holders that can hold small diameter carbide tools as well as drills. These ER collet holders provide a lot of flexibility. The ER11 collet can hold tools with a diameter between 0.5 and 7 mm. The ER16 collet can be used for tools up to 9 mm in diameter. The tool turret can accommodate tool holders up to 12 mm thick. The problem is that any tool holder you buy will be too long. What I ended up doing was cutting them to length with an angle grinder. This means cutting a piece of metal with a disc spinning at 10,000 RPMs, so I made sure to use all of the PPE that made sense to me. Gloves, hearing protection and a face mask. If you do this at home, try using a vise instead of a workmate to hold your tools. The turret also has three positions for cylindrical tool holders with a diameter of 10 mm. These will also have to be cut to size to be able to fit inside the turret. It also makes sense to grind a flat section onto the cylindrical tool holders. This prevents it from jamming due to burrs left by grub screws. I now have a set of high-speed steel tools and carbide tools cut to the correct length. Another thing to note is that tools that stick out too far from the turret could collide with the cross slide. Especially the bottom of the tool holder has a risk of hitting the slide. I made the 3D printed parts to check if the tool position is safe to eliminate some of the guesswork. So that's it for part 2 of this build series. If you like the content, please leave a like or subscribe. Thanks for watching.